Good morning. This is Brian Kaplan. I'm a professor of economics at George Mason University. I'm also a senior fellow at the Salem Center. I'm doing a guest podcast for the Salem Center podcast. Our guest today is researcher Luigi Achille. He is a senior researcher at the European University Institute and also at the Christian Michelson Institute in Bergen. He is an anthropologist who works on two main topics. First of all, human smuggling. And second of all, Palestinian refugees. We're going to be doing two podcasts with him. Today, we'll be doing the first in the series on human smuggling. I would like to welcome Luigi. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. It's, um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Right now, let me just give everyone a little story about how I met Luigi. I was a visiting professor at the University of Palermo this summer. I was teaching a class on immigration to students in, at, the, at the university. One of our activities was a field trip to talk to an Italian migration charity, Caritas. When I listened to what they had to say about human smuggling, it just did not seem very plausible. There was a lot of hyperbole about how human smugglers are only in the business to rob and murder their clients which just didn't make a lot of sense because if that's all the human smugglers do, how are millions of people in Italy? Where did they come from? How do they get there if all the smugglers do is rob and murder them? After that, I went over to Google Scholar and took a look at what actual researchers have to say about this. And Luigi Achille's name came up very near the top. I started reading his work on what was really going on with human smuggling. When I was reading the papers, I said, wait, who's this guy doing it? Luigi Achille sounds Italian. And then I looked at his affiliation in Florence. And I said, wait a second, I'm going to be in Florence in just a few weeks. Maybe I can meet Luigi. I sent out a couple of emails. And before you knew it, I was in the lobby of my hotel in Florence meeting Luigi Achille. He is, since he is a very modest guy, uh, I like uh, he walked in like Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, he really uh, so you know so you know, just you know I know Indiana Jones was of course an archaeologist, not the, not an anthropologist, but still, the analogy is apt. If you just take a look at Luigi, he seems more like an adventurer or a soldier of fortune than a professor. But uh, there he was, and showed that he has both skill sets. All right, so that is how I would like you to picture Luigi. He's just you know, right out of the first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Here he comes. All right. So welcome, Luigi, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the association with Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones has been always my hero, although I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> I'm like him, though. I mean, it's my I mean, <clears throat> performance wise. It's my, I'm much more like Woody Allen. But anyway. <laughs> All right. First question. Let's just dive right in. Uh, as far as I can tell, Luigi, all of your research starts with you traveling to a remote location to study a poorly understood subculture firsthand. Is this a fair description of what you do? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, um, it is a fair description as far as it's concerned. Traveling to a, to to study to a remote, sorry to a location to study poorly understood subculture firsthand. This is exactly what I mean. I try to do. I mean, more or less successfully. It's not always a necessarily remote location. Sometimes it can be just, I mean, next to, I mean, just behind the corner of the street where I live, or it depends. I mean, so far I've been traveling relatively far away, not that far away, but it's part of the parcel of the anthropological tradition traveling in so-called exotic locations. So uh, how do you even get started with something like that? Well, I do ask myself every time the same question. To be honest with you, it's uh, every time before starting a research, uh, I do say, well, how exactly do I start? How do I do it? How do I begin researching these? Um, it's well, the idea that the, the, the issue is to study the, the point is to study this the, the, the culture, the phenomenon, the, the phenomenon you want to study firsthand, exactly as you pointed out. And this is can be difficult because this is uh, as an anthropologist, it requires ethnographic inquiry. Ethnographic inquiry requires long-term involvement, engagement with the population, the, the, the culture, the society you want to study. And this is not something easy to come by, especially after the PhD. I mean, scholars tend to not have so much time to dedicate to, to long-term involvement. Yeah, I mean, you're studying at a university, you just talk to a bunch of colleagues. Then how do you reach out 
not just beyond the yeah. university, but you've got to make contact with a very socially remote group usually, right? Yes, exactly. And it can take up to, I mean, it's, um, it's a lot, it's, 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 it's tricky and depends very much on the available time. So I, I tend to spend a time that ranges from few weeks to months. I mean, ideally, ideally, but this is the ideal, the ideal, um, the ideal word is ideal by definition. You should spend something like a year studying and um, the culture that the society you want to, you want to unpack, you want to investigate but this is something that happens very rarely so you make contact with a poorly understood subculture what comes next you just walk up to them and say hi i'm an anthropologist what do you do yeah 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 exactly this is exactly the reason why i mean <laughs> that's, that's all you do say hi i'm an anthropologist <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly why i always ask myself why 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 am i what why am i doing this again so yeah, as I say i mean you get to spend time with them and ideally you should do participant observation this means spending time and participating with them of course if you do research with uh people that fall under the category of criminals well i mean you cannot really participate unless you want to get arrested yourself but it's um plus is is a kind of a paradox because either you participate or you observe it. you observe sorry uh even, so even criminals do... are not doing criminal stuff all the time right so you can yeah. get as close to the law as anthropological ethics allow is that the idea exactly it's a quite it's, it's a, exactly it's a tricky uh, field so you what you end up doing is asking questions which tend to unpack i mean what their uh, what, what your informants in this case criminal actors what their what is their understanding of what they do what is um, their personal life history so you tend to shy away from um, small details about um, the nature of their of of their uh, criminal um, business. So do those things. They are more more like police work. I'm as an anthropologist. I'm more interested to to, to have their belief. I mean, to get a better understanding. Although I remember one of your human smugglers really liked telling you everything. You right. He wanted to make sure he used his real name and everything. Um. Remember that guy. Yes, yeah, again, sorry. Do you remember that guy? There was one human smuggler you interviewed who insisted that you use his real name. Yes, 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 exactly. I mean, you know, um, as a matter of fact, I mean, what I found, and this was part and parcel of what I found out, I mean, it's um, of the findings is, I mean, I realized that smuggling is not such a, um, something that is, that enjoys such a, con a negative connotation among my research participants. I mean, when, what they do, they sometimes they take pride of that, what they do, and they actually, they, they want to, I mean, now this guy that wanted to, that insisted of uh, citing his name in my research was quite an exception, but usually people are quite open to 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 share their experience, to talk about you, about what they do, and um, yes, I mean, it's, um, I mean, um, of course, they can lie, they can uh, you can they can misunderstand what they do or what what you mean or what, what, what they're actually doing they can they can change their own perspective but i mean as a matter of fact is if you triangulate what they do with what uh, with um with other people's with other findings taken from other other uh, other informants like for example the migrants themselves mm -hmm. other informants that they get to interact with smugglers then eventually you can get some pretty good idea of, of what is true and what is not true all right all right, so today we're going to focus on your research on human smuggling. How did you manage to meet human smugglers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's um, that's a good question. How do you do? How did I do? Well, basically, you know, I started doing this research because I was motivated by the circulation of pejorative views about human smuggling. You know, human smuggling are losing more or reckless villains who do not hesitate a second to toss a human cargo at sea and to prey on the vulnerability of migrants. So I embarked on, as I said, on an ethnographic research, which mostly entail open-ended interviews, spending time with, with uh, my research informants. My research informants were migrants, but also the smugglers themselves. Mm -hmm. So how did I do that? Well, as I say, because smuggling is not a thrown upon practice among migrant and refugee communities, I was able to, to, to contact both migrants and smugglers relatively easy. So, and I use the same mechanism that migrants use to reach out to migrants, to smugglers themselves often, not necessarily, but often they use this mechanism. So I found someone who could vouch for me 
and who could introduce me to the smuggler vouching for me that I was not a police officer. This, this, this person, he was either a, a previous refugee, a previous migrant who used the and, services. And this so, is in Turkey or where, where, where are you first making contact? That was first was in Jordan, then Lebanon, then Turkey. I pretty much follow um, the, uh, when I start doing this type of this, this research, I was I found myself in Jordan carrying out my other research on Palestinian refugees, and that was concomitantly with the outbreak of the Syrian civil war. Uh, so I followed the exodus of some of the people uh, fleeing the refugee one of the refugee camps in um, Palestinian refugee camp in so, Syria. So human, so human smugglers in Jordan would be worried that you might be a police officer from Jordan. Well, in Turkey, yeah, everywhere, right? But if you find so, someone so, so, in, Tur- so in Turkey, they're worried that you're a Turkish police officer. Yeah. Also, Interpol. Ah, Interpol. Ah. So there's that many Interpol agents they would have to worry? Or is, are you... mm, but as a matter of fact, when I say, when I ask them, are you worried about, uh, in Turkey especially, remember, I mm, clearly remember asking this question, sorry, are you, because some of them pointed me to, um, indicated there were some poli- some people, say, these people are, uh, when I was interviewing them, these people are police officers, they are looking at us. He says, oh, are you not worried about that? Say, no, they were not worried because anyway, we do collaborate with them. This was in Turkey. So I don't know to what extent this is true or not, but anyway, this is what I was told. So but you, they, they didn't say that they're giving them some of the money just to look the other way, or, or did they? Yeah, this is this look like that. Apparently, after the implementation of the EU-Turkey agreement, this was that led to um, between Turkey and Europe, where, which led to, to, um, to a substantial decrease of my regular migration. When I asked my informants in Turkey what was happening to them, the, the smugglers, and they say, well, they don't really, nothing did really happen. I mean, the, the same people that they, they, they just they, they were they were allowing us to 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 let, meaning that the border guards allowing us to let uh, migrants leave. Now they are stopping us. So, so in, in your work, in your work, you talk quite a bit about different times the people get arrested or almost arrested. But in, mm-hmm. my, in my memory, all of those cases were ones where they were European authorities that were arresting them. I don't remember any case of someone being arrested in their base country. Is that correct? Mm, yeah. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yes. But the cases that came to my attention, they were all involving, um, yeah, they were always involving uh, it, it, um, authorities such as, I mean, Frontex, the, uh, Interpol, so not national authorities. Mm-hmm. All right. So what are human smugglers like? I mean, like, hmm. like did, did they feel like criminals? Did they feel like merchants? Like, how would you describe them? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, um, there is no um, there is no such a big difference between the smugglers. I mean, they look like pretty much like anybody else. Mm-hmm. There is no. The first time I met them, what struck me was that there was not much difference between smugglers and migrants themselves. Mm-hmm. And this is because it's a matter of fact, in many cases, migrants, not always, but in many cases, especially at the time of my research, many migrants eventually ended up becoming smugglers because they were stranded. Mm-hmm. There is, I mean, there is this tendency to see migrants as smuggling as, as two opposite of, um, of a spectrum, right? On the one hand, you have the smugglers, the predator. On the other, you have the migrant, the, uh, the prey. As a matter of fact, I mean, the, 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 the protracted condition of irregularity leads many, many migrants to eventually get involved in human smuggling. This is a way to cope by, for example, to, 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 because they don't have any more money, they are stranded. So what do you do? You start working as a smuggler. You collaborate with smugglers. Also because you have, you, you have a first-hand knowledge of the route. You may, have, uh, you may, know, you may, know, you may know the local communities where, because you have been stranded in the in the transit country for years. So you ended up speaking the same language of the local community. You may share the same ethnic background of the main client group or the smuggling group. So, so smugglers but, would not, for example, have criminal tattoos or anything like that that would mark No, them not being... really. No, it's not like this type of affiliation that you may see uh, in mafia organizations. It's, there are also bar- barrier to access and they're very low. So <clears throat> um, there is a very small, usually smuggling groups are made up of very loose, small groups. Around these loose, small groups revolve um, a large number of freelancers. These freelancers may be migrants themselves, they may be, most often they are the locals, 
they are those pe the people from the local, the, 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 the nationals in the transit countries. They, they basically, they, they collaborate with smugglers, uh, smuggling groups by um, providing a range of services. For example, taxi drivers, they may drive migrants to the embarkation point. Hotel uh, operators, they may make a deal with the smuggling, uh, the head of the smuggling group by providing the, the, the well-off migrants, those who are better off than others, a good deal to stay while they wait for, um, for transportation across borders, so on and so forth. So it's very common. Just make you an example, Brian. When one day I was interviewing, uh, it was in Turkey, I was interviewing a migrant, sorry, a smuggler, and um, and I was approached by uh, the head of, uh, sorry, the, by the, the owner of a fast food where I was interviewing migrant, the smuggler. And he told me, where are you? He, he thought I was a smuggler myself. He asked me what I was interested in renting the boat of his cousin for smuggling people across the border. So across the sea. So this is, was just a way to round up the salary for the locals. All right. Now you mentioned triangulation. You try to get higher accuracy by talking to a lot of different kinds of people. So besides the human smugglers, what are the other main groups that you talk to to try to get a fuller picture of what's going on? Yeah. Well, as, as I said, I mean migrants. <clears throat> so, so you talk to you talk to the customers. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's um, also because I mean the idea is that we we see migrants as completely. Um, as on the opposite side of the spectrum. So you would also, because what you, we read, what we get from mainstream sources of information is that migrants are systematically deceived and exploited by smugglers. Now, this is the case and this, this can happen. This can occur, of course, I'm not, I'm not denying that. But these are just the stories that ended up badly. As a matter of fact, what if you do ethnographic research, so if you compare my research with other ethnographic uh, researches carried out in the same field, what, if, what it comes out is that the relationship between migrants and smugglers is usually a relationship of trust and where, yeah, of course, violence and uh, exploitation may occur, but this, this is more an exception than the, um, than the norm in the relationship between migrants and smugglers. Anyway, I didn't, I have not all interviewed migrants, I've interviewed also other categories of people, for example, um, border authorities, uh, humanitarian um, operators, mm -hmm. and also other, actors of the smuggling um, market, as they say, these are the freelancers. So such as, for example, hotel owners, truck, taxi drivers, so on and so forth. Did you try to find migrants that were scared of, of smugglers and were determined to do it themselves? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is actually um, some of the smuggling group that was um, that I interviewed was um, that I did research, especially in Turkey, and I, I did extensive research with, well, was born out of fear. And uh, this is what I was told, and out of uh, sort of um, allegiance toward their um, nationals that they were, in this case, were Syrians fleeing the war. So this was uh, uh, the head of the smuggler, was a migrant who tried to who fled Syria after the outbreak of the war outbreak of the war in 2011 and so to reach Europe. He tried first through the central Mediterranean route, means that he tried to reach Egypt, Libya via um, Egypt and then um, other northern uh, other country from the Maghreb. But he was intercepted in Egypt and was returned to, I think, Lebanon. Then he tried again through the eastern Mediterranean uh, route and he got stranded in Turkey. And there where, was where he decided to, to set up a smuggling group and do the business himself. All right. Okay. Uh, now, in some of your work, you said that you expected that you would confirm the standard view of human smugglers as predatory criminals. Uh, to what extent did you change your mind and why? Yeah, this is a very good question. Basically, it's it, it gets to the core of my research in human smuggling. I mean, as I did my field work, I mean, a more complex picture emerged, as you can understand it by now. I mean, this, the time they spent with my research participants show me how human smuggling held strong social and moral significance for both the migrants and the smugglers themselves. So as I said, despite assumptions of violence and deception, trust and cooperation seem to be the rule more than the exception in the interaction between migrants and their uh, service providers, the smugglers. So most smugglers operated by helping members of the immediate circles who reach destination that would have been otherwise um, impossible to reach through legal channels of mobility. So they so the smugglers themselves actually claim to operate a moral economy. 
Now you may say, and, and they would, they would that does prioritize the transport of their national guarantee of full reimbursement of, or even a free passage to the client if the first journey turned out to be unsuccessful. And even uh, so, eventually you may say, well, they were using moral undertone. This is what they are using, what they are telling you, what they are feeding you with, because they want to turn up, because they want to under, um, meet, how you say, minimize, mitigate their involvement in rather unsavory business, which is human smuggling. However, this self-perception was confirmed by migrants themselves. But this, this is what I start to learn. And then eventually things change again. So eventually, um, if you ask, when I ask them, my, both migrants and smugglers themselves, what they thought about human smuggling, all of them, including the smugglers, spoke of smuggling in abs when they spoke of smuggling in abstract in general terms, they were speaking of smuggling as a very abusive and evil practice. And this was puzzling because I mean, migrants would generally refer as smugglers too, they would generally refer to smuggling as smugglers by using their personal names or honorific appellatives such as um, Hajj or Hami, paternal uncle. And these were very good way of talking of someone. No? But when, you, when they were referring to smugglers at large, they used the term Muharreb. No, which is Arabic for smuggler. And this is a word with a negative connotation that evoke exploitation and violence. And this was precisely the type of inconsistency that bothered me. So I was ready to romance resistance. So, so the human smugglers themselves have a negative view of human smugglers. Exactly. But <laughs> on the other hand, if looking at the interactions between migrants and smugglers, they were all happy. It was all, all easy peasy, right? But then when they talk about human smuggling at large, they will say, ah, this is evil and bad. So I was ready, in other words, I mean, Brian, I was ready to romance resistance, to enjoy how my research participants debunked the derogatory ways the media and political leaders use to describe human smuggling, but this didn't happen, not at all. I mean, for my research participants, even the smugglers, smuggling was evil, a smuggler, a smuggler were fundamentally predatory uh, people. And this is, if you pay attention, this is was interesting because the way my interlocutors represented the smuggler was not unique um, to, to them. It actually resonates in the terminology used for indicating human smugglers and their clients across the world. For example, in Latin America, smugglers and migrants are called coyotes and pollos. Uh, pollo stands for chicken. In, uh, in Morocco, they're called wolves and sheep. And uh, in China, um, smugglers are called shetu, which is snake head for, um, uh, for smugglers. So eventually, why there is this consensus? Why, I mean, why there is this this, this um, inconsistency and why the consensus between, uh, um, let's say, uh, mainstream narratives of migration and my own informants' narratives about human smuggling. And what I ended up learning was that these narratives of, about human smuggling, which are narratives of violence and crime, they tend, especially if circulated by powerful media, tend to be, become resilient and highly contagious. In other words, I mean, press coverage of crime and violence provided a language that placed the refugee crisis on the shoulder of the smugglers, while at the same time, it afforded the European Union with the justification for, for more restrictive border policies. So small wonders, the facilitators of irregular migration, AKA the smugglers, eventually were so eager to dissociate themselves from the criminal level of smugglers and the migrants were so scared of this figure. Even though, I mean, the interactions between them were actually relatively good and positive in most of the cases. So the smugglers have a different name for themselves. They say, we're not smugglers, we're something else. That is a very good uh, observation because uh, as I say, migrants call them with honorific names as smugglers. They refer to themselves as being not smugglers. What they, what they say, yeah, I'm not like the other smugglers. Everybody was saying this. So I'm not like the others or I'm not a smuggler at all? <laughs> well, kind of. Uh, sometimes they say I'm not really a smuggler because smugglers are all like that or I'm an exception among smugglers. So, I mean, and therefore I'm not really a So this is a case where what people see with firsthand experience, they have a positive view, but what they know only from TV, they have a negative view. Yeah, and they affect also their self-perception of migrants, of, of, of the phenomenon. Of so listen to this. Sorry. So listening to this, I have a quote from you. And after listening to you, I realized that the quote has a deeper meaning than I originally thought. So the quote is, quote, of the majority of migrants with whom I spoke did not perceive their smugglers as exploitative, end quote. And what I'm realizing now is the key word is there. They did not perceive their smugglers as exploitative. Right. So it wasn't, you know, they might have had a negative view of smugglers in general. It's just the smugglers they knew they thought were okay. <laughs> Is that exactly. the right way to read the sentence? Yeah. Yeah, so please exactly. elaborate. Majority of migrants did not perceive their smugglers as exploitative. 
Yeah, I mean, it's um, the majority of migrants had positive and uh, as positive positive experience with their own smugglers, but when they ask, when they were asked about human smuggling at large, they were they told smuggling smuggling was a very um, very dangerous business, which to a certain extent is also true because I mean, it's not only because of the smugglers, not only because the smugglers are evil people, that is that is not the point, but because I mean, human smuggling is entail, is, is an activity, a phenomenon generated by protracted condition of immobility in a situation of, ex, uh, of um, in a context of tightening of border controls, criminalization of migration, and all this makes the business extremely dangerous. I mean, the reason why, I mean, uh, it's, it's not a case that many people died, lose their lives while trying to reach their destinations um, by being by being smuggled. It, it so is smuggling, not the, it's not the case that many died. Well, the majority don't die. Yes, many yes died. Well, of course, of course, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So this is what I meant with that um, quotation. Now, I know a lot of economists are listening or social scientists generally and saying, ah, survivorship bias. Luigi only talked to the people that didn't get murdered. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how would you convince these people that, in fact, you are getting a reasonable sample and you're not just seeing the success stories? Well, I mean, it's a um, well, different manner. First of all, I mean, I, my findings, it's, it's ethnographic research, highly qualitative, qualitative research. So, I mean, it's always, uh, I'm, we are always exposed to the accusation of being biased, which is true to, to a certain extent. But my findings echo the findings of many other ethnographic studies that have confirmed precisely my same observations. This but, one- but this Could they all have survivorship bias? No, that, that they, I mean, that all the people they have met, the migrants they have met, they actually been successfully smuggled across borders, and they have a relatively positive experience of their smuggling, um, well, of their smugglers, not of the smuggling uh, process. The smuggling process can be very traumatic, but they speak in, in, in relatively good terms of their own smugglers, sometimes even depicting them as, um, depicting the smuggler as a savior. Often this happened to me and to many other ethnographic researchers. This would be an explanation. The other one is that, well, if human smuggling would not be at least some in some manner successful, I mean, there were there would have not been human smuggling at all. There would not, I mean, you would not understand why migrants keep embarking on these dangerous journeys. I mean, what I think about is what social scientists call near miss analysis, where you deal with survivorship bias by saying, okay, well, did anyone almost die? Did you get close mm -hmm. to dying? And, the, and this is a way where you can talk to people who are alive and yet they will have experiences where you know someone who died. Did you do that? Yeah. And so, no, say, say again, sir. You know, this, this is where you talk to people who survived, but you say, do you know any other people that, any other migrants that did die or where they just disappeared at sea and you never heard from their human smuggler again? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, this is a question that you ask people and that you come across. Yes, I mean, it's, um, I mean, um, of course, you cannot interview those who die, but, but so you, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's a matter of fact, most who try to embark, that most migrants that try to reach destination, to reach, to, to embark on dangerous journeys, I mean, I mean being, getting smuggled uh, across, uh, across borders, they do reach their destinations. Or anyway, they don't die. They may not reach their destination. But the point is that the, the number of people trying to cross is, a, is, a, is I mean, it's a high number of people. Not, I mean, not compared to the, the number of people inside Europe, of course, but in, in, in sheer, in sh the sheer number of people crossing is a high number. And among them, a, a, a sizable minority may lose, their, may, may lose their life, which is already, which is appalling, of course. But I mean, the, the point is, you should ask yourself what, what's, whether it's best, whether it's best staying home, or and, and, and facing, I mean, perhaps a more, let's say, a more um, more imminent um, death, or trying your, or trying your, um, you say, uh, or trying to to make the crossing. It's, um, I mean, it's many times. I mean, I was many many times I was uh, smuggling in regular journeys. Which involved in most of the regular journeys, most of the cases involved human smuggling, was um, compared to um, to gambling. Mm -hmm. So I mean, either you, it's 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 a chance that you have to take, and uh, and this is a chance that those who try, those who embark on regular journeys, want to take. Yes, of course, many don't do it. 
uh, because they don't want to take this chance. Uh, is it, I don't, I cannot, I don't know whether the majority of those who want to leave, they don't, I mean, uh, the majority of people, they eventually, they, they would like to leave, don't leave because they fear smuggling or whether this is just a minority who stays on because of fear, fear of smuggling. This is something I cannot, I cannot tell you. All right, so how does human smuggling actually work? Just walk me through the steps. So I'm in Turkey, I wanna to get to Germany. What do I do exactly? So what do you do? You just get in touch with the smuggler and then it depends very much on the time um, of the, the period. I mean, when you wanna leave the year, the, 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 and, um, and the, and the, well, the fast changing scenario of border control. So if you were in Turkey before, the EU Turkey agreement. So before 2000, before March 2016, it was relatively easy, but even now, I mean, reaching Greece, but was much more, much easier. So what do you do? You would, for example, going in some of the, either mean, either you reach out to the smuggler because you had some, someone, someone was vouching for you, who was, uh, was vouching some smuggler to you because this was some successful smuggled migrant who was, um, was acting a pull factor by, by putting you in touch with the smuggler because this was vouching for his services or her services. Smugglers can be also female. And, um, or you go to a city and then some, which is known to be a hotspot of human smuggling. This can be Istanbul, for example, Izmir or Bodrum. And then you, you, you speak with other migrants and they point you to the, 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 to the place where usually smugglers they congr congregate and, they, and you get in touch with them. Otherwise, another way was, which was actually was, was recently approached by uh, Facebook, well, now met. Apparently one, of, one, uh, one way through which smugglers were um, advertising their services and migrants were getting in touch with smugglers was through Facebook. Really? So, yeah. Uh, does Facebook, Facebook still allow that? I think so. Even though, I mean, now they, I, I was told they even use TikTok and other social media uh, to advertise their services. So for example, Telegram, Telegram and uh, WhatsApp. Anyway, when uh, at the time of my research, when I was in Turkey, there were clearly, I mean, pictures of um, uh, on Facebook, on open pages, open um, groups where they were um, advertising, I mean, Okay, so, so I so I find I find my smuggler, and then we negotiate the price, and then do I give him all the money, or what happens? No, usually what you do is you there is a, the system is called a Huala system. What do you do? You find someone who acts as an intermediary. You give the money to that person that is trying to give, give them all the money up front or a part, or how does it? All work? of them up front to the to the intermediary. The intermediary uh, doesn't uh, give a penny to the smuggler. One you reach. Uh, the there's a, so there's an intermediary. Ah. Yeah, exactly. Once you reach destination, this is called a Wala system. Once you reach destination, uh, then you give the money, um, the, the, you call the intermediary and intermediary give the money to the smuggler. So there's a built-in money back guarantee. If you don't get in, the intermediary gives your money back? Exactly, exactly. Oh, so, this is totally, so this is totally standard actually. It's so, sorry, it's totally? It's totally standard. So basically, no one would just pay the smuggler up front. You would always go to an intermediary. Uh, well, exactly. Yeah, pretty much works like that. But there are, I mean, there are also cases of um, of smugglers that get all the money up front. For example, the, the the group I was working with was getting all the money up front precisely because it was trusted to be uh, a very reliable um, group. So they were, and they were even guaranteed full reimbursement if the first, second, even third journey turned out to be unsuccessful. So if basically the boats, because they were, um, they were embarking people on small boats and dingoes, 10 meters dingoes that would have made that would have crossed the border, the, the, the small stretch of water between Eastern, Western Turkey and Eastern Greece. If the boat was, uh, was pushed back by authorities, illegally, by the way, um they were uh, they the they were um entitled with free rides the, the, the migrants so they had, they had not to pay uh another rights so by another way of paying is western union which works just ah. just, just just well so basically all right, all right, so, so so i give you the i give the money to an inter intermediary do i get a ticket do I get a no, ticket you, for the boat? No, or no, 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 there is not really a ticket, not as far <laughs> as I know, <laughs> but yeah, but the... So it's all, it's all, like, there's, there's, got, there's a list somewhere, this person is paid, and then 
I, and then they tell you, tell me, show up at this beach or, and, and then get on the boat or, or what, what happens next? Yeah, 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 exactly. And then you crawl, and then it depends, as I say, on the, on the, on the border scenario and whether things have changed. So if we were in Turkey before the EU, uh, Turkey agreement deal, well, I mean, once you made it to, to Greece, well, then you went, you the, 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 the road to Europe, well, we're already in Europe, to, to Central Europe, let's say to Germany, it was pretty much open. So you could, I mean, at that time, I mean, EU, EU member states and other states, they were actually providing migrants with sort of um, temporary permit papers that allowed them to use uh, free transport, well, transportations, public right. transportations, not for free, but at least they could move by public transportation, which was way safer than using human smuggling, smugglers. And so that was pretty much used, easy, relatively easy to reach uh, Germany or other rich, or other rich countries in Europe. Things have changed after that. So what happened that after you reach Greece, then you needed another smuggler. Mm -hmm. As I said, smuggling tend to be small groups who may enter into partnership with one another, but just for a short period of time. So there is no this sort of, um, I would say, um, all encompassing uh, conglomerate, criminal conglomerate that tend to, to run all the, the, the journey, the regular journey from A to B. So it's more the case of small groups who enter into partnership with one another. So what do you do? You, you negotiate, either you negotiate another deal, or if the smuggling group is relatively bigger, they may have some offshots also in the country of arrival that um, either put you in touch with other smugglers that operate the, the other, another smuggling group that operates the journey, the crossing, or they may operate the crossing themselves. All right, so let's step back a little bit. Uh, you mentioned this notion of moral economy which I think many of, many of our listeners will not have, any, have, any, have ever heard of it. So you rely on this notion of moral economy to explain how human smuggling actually works. Uh, how does moral economy differ at all, or if at all, from the economist's idea that business reputation is crucial mm -hmm. for long run profitability? Yeah, this is a good comparison. Well, I think this, the notion of, of moral economy overlaps only in part with the idea that reputation is crucial for running a business. Mm -hmm. Let me explain why. I mean, yes, of course, even for human smuggling, reputation is crucial for making the, the business run. I mean, successfully, as I said before, success, successful smuggle migrants, who, who of course made it through, survived the journey, can operate as a proof factor, you know, by tempting their kin and friends and acquaintances to embark in a similar journey. However, moral, in, this, in this case, I mean, it pretty much echoes the same concept, right? Mm, used by um, economists. However, moral economy as a concept goes mad, a bit further than that. To begin with, I mean, moral economy is important because it shows how economic practice, um, economic practices are, are not exclusively driven by a cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. aimed to maximize profit for the long terms. So they also appear, in this case, the, the, the transaction between mass migrant, migrants and smugglers, it appears also to be embedded in, in, um, in moral obligations and social norms. For example, some of the smugglers help uh, migrants to reach destination, some of those who I met, help reaching migrants to reach destination that would have been otherwise precluded through legal channels of mobility, not only because they wanted to make money out of it, but also as a moral duty. And this was, and, and again, this was a show, and, it, and, then, and the reason why I believe this was true is because they provided, in some cases, they even provide this service for no cost. Then again, uh, not for everybody. I'm not saying that uh, profit was, I mean, uh, was not part of the business. The idea of making money, maximizing profit was part of the business. But there were also moral obligations, social norms, and smugglers behave differently according to the ethnic group they, they were engaged with. For example, with uh, providing even free rides to certain categories of, um, of migrants, such as, for example, children or political political um, political migrants, political, sorry, refugees. But, uh, the, uh, Brian, the way I use moral economy, um, this is a way I use moral economy, and this is a way it goes a bit further than the idea of reputation. But there is another way why moral economy is important here. In this sense, I mean, uh, I'm, I know that probably the audience may not be familiar with the work of Didier Fassan, but this is the, um, the author that um, was I, where, where I borrowed uh, that uh, came out with um, a very interesting conception of moral economy. In this sense, I mean, 
my interest lies not only with moral economy, but also with the economy of morals. Now here, the economy in capital letters stopped being the object of analysis and it's replaced by morality. So in other words, I'm interested to, to see how morality and ethics are a, a field of indeterminacy and struggles where good and evil are, how can I say, the, the, the temporary outcome of a mediation process. Why I'm saying this? This, this, this conception of moral economy is important if we want to understand how current border policies affect the relationship between smugglers and migrants. So I'm not interested so much in the, in, in the, in the economy of, I'm also interested in the, con, in the moral economy. So how morality fits into economy. Also how, a, a, how different moral understandings basically coexist and clash one another. So against, under the, the, under the background of the current tightening of border control, the smuggling, pro, what I notice is in the interaction between migrants and smugglers is that the smuggling process establishes a sort of ethical scene, if you want, through which migrants and smugglers constitute themselves as a sort of moral community against an immoral Europe and an immoral America and immoral Australia who wants to keep desperate people outside their borders. Why this is important? This is important because eventually smugglers, precisely because of this economy of morals, ended up to be much more trusted and the relationship between smugglers and migrants can be much can be bound can can be much more um, strong than um, the relationship between the legal child then then um, can, can can eventually be very strong and migrants end up trusting much more smugglers than uh, in many cases than legal channels of mobility hmm. All right, so let's just again step back a bit. Uh, when I was in Italy, I went to a lot of grocery stores, and um, most notably the Lidl chain, which we now have right here in my own town. Do you shop at Lidl, uh, Luigi? Yeah, sometimes. All right, so suppose you did an, eth an ethnography of Lidl grocery stores in Italy. So you go and you talk to the workers, you talk to the customers, you talk to the managers, you talk to the investors. Uh, so you do an ethnography of Lidl grocery stores in Italy. Would moral economy be just as important as it is in human smuggling? Would it be more important, less important? Mm -hmm. What would you find? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, that is a good question. To be honest, I mean, I'm not sure I can answer it, but let me try. I mean, what I would need to do first is to do some research, some preliminary research in a little grocery store and then figure out how it is the relationship between customers and vendors. I mean, certainly reputation play a role, right? So, mm -hmm. but I wonder, what is the role of moral obligations? So in this case of moral economy, what is the role of moral obligations, social norms in determining the relationship between uh, the legal and its customers? And its customers. So it would be interesting, for example, to see whether current economic changes are establishing, um, establishing and um, creating some sort of ethical scenario to which, for example, just, I mean, just guessing, the legal and its clients constitute themselves as a moral community against an immoral business elite that is, is impoverishing ordinary citizens? I don't know. I mean, I'm actually curious to know what you think of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I would think that if you talk to the customers, they've got some notion of fairness where if you, know, you buy a product and it's broken, you might complain, and then the manager is likely to say, oh, that's terrible, and let me replace it. Or similarly for the workers, you know, if there's a work, if there's a, you know, if there's a pregnant cashier, I mm -hmm. think it's very likely that she would be given the easier job. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, and again, these are all ones where you could say, well, this is all part of business reputation. And that I think that a lot of economists would say that. But on the other hand, you might say, well, there's maybe there's more going on. Maybe it's not just reputation. There's also people who are saying, yeah, well, I could make more money if I just said, you know, tough luck if you're pregnant, but it wouldn't be right. So yeah, I mean yeah. that's that's the I mean you know, like, you know like since you are a customer, you know that there that you know, like, there's a lot of fairness norms. Like you don't cut in line. At least, you know, like, I mean maybe exactly. maybe it's different in Italy. Although I, yeah, I saw the Italians seem to respect lines uh, pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean we are we are sometimes yes, it depends very much. Yeah, <laughs> but we are <laughs> we are getting used to it, and it's um, yeah. I mean I I, I think anyway even in. Um, because there is this tendency to believe that somehow neoliberalism is, um, is a sort of uh, all sweeping uh, wave that is encompassing, is replacing everything, all uh, social norms that were pre-existing social norms. What I think is that mm, this type of um, neoliberalism is, I mean, actually coexisting with previous social norms and um, moral obligations. I mean, so, so in a way, as a foreigner, you notice this moral economy more perhaps I got yelled at sometimes because I wasn't putting my items on the cart correctly. 
So apparently oh, you're see. supposed to take your jars of spaghetti sauce and put them on their side. And people like, thought that I was, there was something wrong with me. Like, how can you not know this? They're like, well, I wouldn't occur to me, but uh, you know, it, it seemed, but there almost was this moralistic attitude of, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> not putting your spaghetti sauce in the right way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, especially when it comes to spaghetti Italians, take it very seriously. Yes. All right, now let's move on to some of my doubts. Uh, so you say that, quote, control of migration and the safety of migrants are not at odds with each other. Uh, this just seems false to me. Um, you know, so I have my book, Open Borders. I've done a lot of work on this. Looks to me like migration would be almost perfectly safe under open borders. You just buy a bus ticket or a boat ticket, plane ticket, and you legally go wherever you want. I was not worried for my safety when I was taking trains around Italy. Um, uh, and then I'd say, whenever you move closer open borders, migration gets safer. And whenever you move away, migration gets more dangerous. Um, so how am I wrong or am I, what am I missing? No, no, you are not missing anything. I mean, you are not wrong at all. I mean, uh, it's interesting because up to 20 years ago, topic um, this then the border and the open border topic was open to discussion also by mainstream media. Now it's, I mean, now it's a topic that, if you notice, is hardly whispered, even in, in radical universities. I mean, you, you must be crazy to talk about open borders right now. I mean, I say it's gotten more attention in America. So, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm single-handedly changing the conversation, but the amount of attention it's gotten in, uh, in the U.S. in the last 10 years, I think, has gone up a lot. Yeah, but it's, it's considered to be a, I mean, I do actually, I do pretty much uh, open to border, border to open borders. I'm, I'm actually very much into that. I wonder to what extent is considered to be a viable uh, um, way of dealing with migration uh, among the political elites. Yes, and, I mean, I uh, say among elites with power, very, you know, it's something that you accuse someone else of believing. But again, yeah, among yeah. people that are thinking about optimal policy, then I think it's a, an idea that at least a lot of people are willing to consider. So, yeah. so really what you say is control migration and safety migrants are. At odds with each yeah, other. no, no, I mean, but uh, yeah, but let me answer your question because it's a very good one. So I agree with you. So the reason why, I mean, the extent to which your line of reasoning is true is that it is demonstrated by the fact that an increase in the tightening of border controls leads to more migrant deaths. So it's definitely opening borders, definitely the way to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So when I claim that control of migration, the safety of migrants are not at odds with uh, uh, one another, well, what I meant to do was to express more to express a critique to those political leaders who boast about privileging the, the security of their country over the safety of strangers, right? Mm -hmm. So studies have shown how facilitating the entry of asylum seekers and opening our borders do not necessarily mean the demise of states sovereign, sovereign right to control population flows. If you, <coughs> sorry, if you, if we think about, if, uh, just, just pay attention. I mean, just let's reflect on on the opportunities that um, that control may offer in this case. I mean, if mobility and passages increase, so may also the opportunity for the states to consolidate their sovereignty as incentives for regulation flourish. For regulation flourish. I mean, in other words, I mean, if you, there is this tendency to believe that the more, uh, if we open the, if we, if we allow migrants to come through, well, I mean, there won't be any more control, which is not, which is, uh, which is absolutely, I mean, um, uh, which is absolutely false, because if if the, the the mobility and passages increase, also the opportunities for the states to control and to um, to take stock of this actually legal flow of mobility increase, which is uh, which is which increases also the control over the or the sovereignty of your own state. So this is what I meant to to say with this line of reasoning. All right, and. I have a, I, I think I know what you're going to say here, but I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> All right. When we, when I actually read some of your work, you seem to be writing as if European authorities' top priority is to keep migrants safe, but somehow they just can't figure out the best way to accomplish the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, isn't the real story that European authorities barely care about migrant safety? And I'd say the best explanation for all the policies we've seen is that they have two conflicting goals. First mm -hmm. goal to stop virtually all third world migration. They just want that number as close to zero as possible. But second goal, they wanna keep their own hands clean. They don't wanna actually be seen going and, and killing migrants. They don't, want, they don't want there to be uh, the media to be able to show you let a boat sink and let a hundred children die. But the goal is to have no one come, but no one sees that I actually stop them. 
right? So how, you know, how am I wrong in this <laughs> admittedly yeah. very cynical view, but I think it explains a lot. No, personally, I don't think you're, again, you are, don't think you're wrong at all. I mean, so again, when, when I write that the European authorities drop priorities to keep migrants safe, well, I mean, this is their intended goals. I mean, and I want to do sure. Is there, is, there now, there, is there, you mean that it's their announced goal or their official goal? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's not what, Tensions are secret, but, an, but, but announcements are public. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. This is the announced call, exactly. And this is, and, and by, by investigating, I mean, by investigating to what extent these goals are accomplished, I mean, it, it allows me to show the discrepancy between their announced goals and the actual outcomes. It's for me, if you want, it's for me a way of exposing their hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, let's say, Brian, I mean, I think also um, there may be also a few policymakers that are genuinely concerned about migrants and they think that the best way to go is to strengthen security-based migration policies. Mm -hmm. So in this case, my and many others goal, uh, many other researchers like myself goal is, is to show, how, I mean, to show these people how wrong they are. I mean, even the people that are worried, it, it seems like they're much more worried that one child might drown on a beach in Greece than that a million migrants might be killed or you know, people who want to migrate might, might be killed by ISIS. Mm -hmm. Seems like, like there's a, just a lot of focus on did it happen right next to me? Can someone blame me and say it's my fault? And yeah. as long as they're a thousand miles away, I'm clear, even though you could say, well, they're only a thousand miles away because of your Coast Guard. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Very true. All right. Now let's get back to the Catholic migration charity Caritas. I owe them a debt because they're the ones that led me to discover you, Luigi. Uh, but, <laughs> but still, it wasn't all good. <laughs> all right. Uh, I was listening to their spokesman talk for about an hour about the horrors of human smuggling and illegal migrant labor. And you know, finally, I did have to raise my hand and just say, look, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. They had so many complaints about how horrible human smuggling was, how terribly illegal migrants are treated by employers. And I said, look, it's better than nothing. It's better than what they would get back home. Can't you at least admit that? And I got a very strong denial. And my favorite one was, you know, that's what the exploiters say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. what the exploiters say. So. I mean, their response was really, you are an unwitting accomplice of the exploiters, or actually the way they were looking at me, I was almost like, you know, did the exploiters send you here to disrupt our wonderful <laughs> <laughs> efforts? Yeah. So you, what do you say about you know, organizations like Caritas, where on the one hand, they say that they really care, but on the other hand, they seem to have just such a confused view about what's going on. Yeah, you, to be honest, I mean, I found stupidity more appalling than recklessness. I mean, this is strictly connected with what I just said. I mean, there, there are people who are genuinely convinced that the suffering of migrants is connected with smugglers and not with the policy measures implemented to keep migrants outside. And, uh, and this is scary because, I mean, they have been, um, I mean, I, I'm much more, um, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't use the word attuned, but I would understand much more the reckless uh, policy makers or le political leaders who do not care about migrant safety. And they just use, and they just talk about, uh, they, just, they have their announced goals, but then they have their intended goals, as you made it, <clears throat> as you pointed out before, which are different. But when the, I believe that many people, many, I don't know many, but a few people, they're actually genuinely convinced that my, the problem is that there are evil, my, evil smugglers. Now, sm smugglers may be good, may be evil like pretty much any other human being, is providing a service that is in great demand precisely because it, it's, it's not provided by official channels of um, by official channels. And so the problem is that this human smuggling is created by the, by states uh, migration policies. So how can you think that the problem is the smuggling? You are you are I mean um, yeah. you are just focusing on the on the call on the on the on the outcome of and, and missing the calls of this outcome. Now, honestly, when I was listening to them, they did not seem stupid to me. The word that came to my mind was just dogmatic mm. because they, they just seemed to have so little curiosity. It was just, look, I see that there are these horrible people making money off of human misery and therefore they're, they're terrible and they need to be stopped. And to say, well, look, it's better than nothing. They just did not want to deal with that. But again, like, like you know, like 
it, it, it was almost like a religious rejection of fact rather than something you know, yeah. which in a way require it does require some intelligence to be so dogmatic actually uh, well to a certain extent also some stupidity but i mean i'm sure the people you met they are highly where they were highly, highly intelligent people also because i mean um especially if they managed to, to put in touch with me no i'm joking no especially because i mean because i mean i met many people from i met few people from caritas who were highly intelligent people and other similar organizations charity organizations uh, but overall, I mean, this this uh, this obsession with smugglers being going about uh, this obsession about trying to clarify where smugglers are evil, where smuggling us, um, smuggling are good. I find it very short-minded. Yeah, and also, of course, at Caritas, they really hated the Sicilian farmers that were employing migrants. Right? And mm. when I was saying again, like, isn't it better than nothing? They said, you know, like, no, like, you know, if you saw how bad the conditions were, then you would realize that no one would want that. And I'm like, well, like, look, like, I've never worked on a farm. I like, I'm 51 years old. Yeah, like, I, I couldn't do it. But still, like, if you were a farmer back home in Africa, and then you go and farm in Sicily, probably for several times the pay, like, of course, that's better. Uh, that, that's better for you. And, and then even more strongly, when you can't get, get a legal job. So, like, mm. like, I mean, like, we, what do you think about that? Well, this is very much connected with um, with another funding um, that came out of um, of my research and others, other researchers as well. Is that basically um, what we call exploitation? So, in this case, for example, getting into, I mean, accepting very low uh, low wage um, works and jobs. I mean, getting explored, what we define exploitation sometimes is the only way forward for people that have, they are um, in a situation of um, protracted vulnerability. So want something and notice, for example, in, in the Beka Valley, in, uh, in, uh, which is uh, uh, an agricultural area uh, bordering near the border we see in Lebanon. Um, basically, many, I saw many, many children Anyway, underage migrants who ended up working um, in very highly, what we would define highly exploitative work, mm -hmm. works. But this was for them the only way mm -hmm. of escaping out of Syria. So again, what, what's worse, exactly as you pointed out, is, is getting exploited by some people uh, who make money out of them, but somehow managing to escape um, immediate danger and even deaths in some cases, or or actually staying where you are <clears throat> and facing the death and the danger. I tend, I, I, mean, I bet the moral economy idea is very relevant there. I bet that if you actually go to the farmers that are working with children, they're not mm -hmm. giving them the hardest, most dangerous work. They probably are actually saying, well, they're kids, so they, it's okay for them to do certain kinds of work, but not others. You know, that's my guess. Do you have any information? Well, I think it depends very much. With pretty much again, we get back again to this um, to this misleading dichotomy, this mis misleading um, issue, which is uh, asserting. I mean, trying to get understand to understand whether people are evil or good. I mean, the point is not whether. I mean, there are definitely there are people that are definitely very reckless people who are exploiting, preying uh, on 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 these migrants' vulnerability. Who do not. I mean, employer who do not care at all. These kind of people that they tend to to provide the the. the, the, um, the uh, the type of character characters that uh, appear in TV shows, in movies, <laughs> and everything. you know. On the other hand, you have actually very good people who, who, do, who do exactly as you do, and they actually they may pay migrants more, uh, or they do not want to prey on them. It's the point is that we shouldn't focus too much on whether these people are good or not, but more on the conditions that lead migrants to engage to get engage in a situation of exploitation, because this is a coping mechanism. Uh, so should, we should focus much more on that rather than being obsessed with this good, with evil or, or, or good uh, dichotomy. All right, now let me share one of my pet theories with you. So I say that European authorities desire to keep their own hands clean. I, I just don't want anything bad to happen if I'm nearby. Explains why they're so strongly opposed to third world migration in the first place. So like, I'm an economist and I've, I've worked with the numbers a bit. So, you know, I'd say like even low skilled migrants would be an economic positive if Europe used a Gulf monarchy approach where migrants, first of all, are not eligible for government benefits. And second of all, work for wages that are very low by European standards, but still very high by migrant standards. The problem is that this looks terrible on TV. 
That's mm -hmm. why it's so common to have European shows about the terror, the horrible conditions of migrant workers in the Gulf monarchies. So, you know, the, you know, so people in Sweden, they watch that and they can feel very superior, even though you'll see United Arab Emirates is 85% foreign born. They just let in an enormous number of migrants, including low skilled migrants. And they're willing to do it in part because they don't treat them like Sweden does. They don't say you are honored guest in our house. They say, all right, well, you're the janitor and you've got a job to do. So basically mm -hmm. my story is it's a lot more politically palatable if you keep desperate people out of sight and out of mind, even if you're making their desperation much, much worse by refusing to let them in. Mm -hmm. so, how, so how do you react to that, Luigi? That's my, my story, what's yours? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, um, well, you know, the Gulf monarchy approach is, um, is not exactly as you pointed out, is, is, um, is, is quite, can be quite scary. Uh, I mean, it calls to mind phenomena that fall under the label of modern slavery. But yes, I mean, you are right when you say that everything um, migrants, would, I mean, um, when you say that migrants would not affect negatively the economy in Europe, pretty much as elsewhere, like in the United States. So my, my reflection, my reaction to what you said is, yes, let's do, let's do something. Let's, I mean, let's employ them, perhaps under better condition than the Gulf monarchy approach. But um, also because interestingly, I mean, research shows that while, I mean, my, the migrations as an effect, as it usually have, an econo have a positive economic effect on, um, in the states that receive migrants. But however, it's rather small. So there is all this talk about, you know, migrants affecting negatively. As a matter of fact, what research has found out is they affect relative, quite positively, but very small. So if a very little, the type, the, 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 the sheer number of migrants that do these, uh, the so-called destination countries in the so-called global north are receiving is, doesn't really have an effect. Mm -hmm. if, if they as, accept, if as, as they accept so few. Yeah. Say again? Yeah, you know, because they accept so few. Because you know they are exactly. always accepting far exactly. less than one percent exactly. population of exactly. the EU. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, um, so the, exactly they accept so few, and nonetheless, there is such a talk about migrants invading uh, the global North countries. So, about, so I think you are particularly right when you say that it is um, far more convenient, politically speaking, to keep migrants outside because you use the word politically speaking. And that indeed, I mean, it's, it, it has never been a migrant crisis, given that exactly as you say, the sheer number of migrants entering Europe is absolutely ne negligible with very little impact on the economy. And if they have an impact, it's a positive one. So it has always been a political crisis. The so-called global North is trapped in a political tension. So on the one hand, we, have, we, have, uh, we boast moral supremacy, primacy, as bastion of liberal and humanitarian values. And on the other, we, we need to secure votes, I mean, not, not, I mean, political leaders, by capitalizing on irrational fears and ignorance, which leads to implement security-based policies. But I mean, if you think about, and this, is, this comes to, to the, the, we get back to smugglers. If you think under this background, against this background, smugglers are a blessing for Europe. I mean, on the one hand, they provide Europe with a scapegoat, an easy scapegoat for distancing itself from uh, the responsibilities of the deaths and suffering that we are daily witnessing in the Mediterranean. I mean, on the other, smugglers provide a justification for increasing restrictive border policies and the criminalization of migration. From a political point of view, smuggling is a win-win deal for Europe. Hmm. All right. Now, I'm going to say something that could get you expelled from anthropology, but that's okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, listening to your work, I say a lot of this sounds like neoliberalism to me. I mean, but honestly, I mean, I know a lot of people who have a lot of confidence the free markets work well. And even a lot of them, if you said, hey, human smuggling works well, they'd say, no, 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 markets aren't going to work well there. But you seem to be saying that this illegal marketing human smuggling does work well. All right, so here's a question. Uh, you know, first of all, are you a rare anthropologist who does have neoliberal sympathies? And if not, why not? Seems like your work is right up this alley. Yeah, uh, that is an amazing question you ask me that you, you mentioned when we met, but you, we didn't really talk about that. And this led me, let me, I mean, let me think. Oh, I say, oh, damn, I mean, Am I a neoliberal without I me mean, realizing that? I mean, uh, <laughs> don't worry, I won't tell. <laughs> don't tell. Don't tell anybody. Please. So, I mean, quite on the contrary. 
I mean, I always thought I belonged to this course of anthropologists with little sympathies for neoliberalism. So whatever neoliberalism, neoliberalism exactly means. But, I mean, but once your question is true, I mean, the, I mean, my approach may come, may come across as neoliberal, but I don't think, but let me clarify why it's not neoliberal. Because I don't think that the smuggling market is the best possible, if we are talking about just markets, mm -hmm. right? If I don't think that the smuggling market is the best possible option for migrants. I mean, I, what I think is that human smuggling is the only available market right. for it's, many it's, migrants. It's the best available option. Uh, it's exactly. Not, it's not exactly. the best thing in the world. Exactly. So what I mean is that if we compare human smuggling to a process of neoliberal privatization of mobility, mm -hmm. I mean, this process is leading to immense suffering. Yet smuggling is the only available market for many migrants. And the smugglers are the private suppliers who provide a service for people wishing to reach safety and escape misery and death. But it's not a good, it's not a good deal, a deal for migrants. Exactly as you say, it's the only deal under these circumstances. So I mean, having said that- Wouldn't neoliberal privatization be anyone who wants to can do it legally? And then it's just like a boat ticket or a bus ticket and everything is fantastic. Isn't that yeah, neoliberal but, privatization? Yeah, but I mean, the point is that what I think is that a robust, I mean, a, a, a strong intervention by the state on the, on the side of the state aimed to facilitate mobility, which is not exactly neoliberal. This would be the real silver bullet here. Hmm. I mean, in a sense, I mean, uh, uh, this is exactly the other way around of neoliberalism. If you think. So I think Europe and its member state for in, in this specific sh uh, case, I mean, should intervene by addressing the demand of smuggling services rather than curbing the offer. And this should be done by reinforcing existing legal channels of mobility and cre creating new ones. So in other words, they should intervene strongly to facilitate human mobility. But I mean, what, would the, what do they have to do other than say, if you pay for a bus ticket, you're okay and you can come? What, why do they? Well, for example, granting humanitarian visas, allowing them, right? So right. the creation okay. of humanitarian corridors. Yeah, but if anyone can come, you don't need a humanitarian visa. You just say, hey, I have, I, I went and, pay, and paid 10 euros for a bus ticket from Turkey over to Greece, and now I'm here. Right, that would be the real neoliberal thing, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, I think then depending on the type of migrants that they arrive, I mean, refugees, for example, uh, they, they may very much be in need also because some of them may be very much traumatized or some uh, mm -hmm. under, under, undergone, they may have undergone very traumatic experiences. So they actually need to be, um, they need a state, a state intervention to facilitate their integration inside the society. All right. And uh, last question for this interview. All right, so illegal markets work worse than legal ones, according to almost everyone. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Like in an illegal market, it's a lot easier to result, you know, in a legal market, reputation is a much bigger benefit. If everyone says, oh, Lidl is the best grocery store, that's great for Lidl. But an illegal market, if everyone says that Brian sells the best cocaine, that's dangerous for me because that puts me on the radar of the authorities. Uh, you know, so there's a you know, and there's you know, that's just one of many reasons why illegal markets work worse than legal ones. So it does seem like if you're optimistic about a major illegal market, you should be even more optimistic about legal markets. Uh, as we say in the U.S., I'm asking for a friend. Well, not really. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you, you think? have found. Yeah, I think you have found one. Uh, um, yeah, you have found definitely a friend. But, I mean, for the reasons I mentioned before, I think that is, um, you see, I mean, this is the human smugglers are the, are they provide, they are sort of private, well, they, they are providing, um, they are private actors and they represent the, the uh, epitomize, if you want, the privatization of um, irregular mobility, right? Uh, what I found is that human smuggling is, is, um, is not devoid of risks and dangers for migrants themselves. If the state would intervene, facilitating not only the migration of migrants, not only the mobility of migrants, but also their integration. Well, that would be way much safer for migrants and much more useful for states um, facilitating the integration of these new, of these people arriving. Uh, so definitely I think it's a uh, legal market would work better. The problem is the illegal markets provide a service that is not provided by, in, by legal markets. That's why it worked very well. All right, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners, Luigi? Oh, mm, not really, actually. Your questions, they have pretty much covered everything I wanted to say. All right, so molte grazie, Luigi. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to our next podcast on Palestine, poverty, and neoliberalism. 
All right. So Thanks. thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the podcast and we will be coming back and probably next episode with another installment of Luigi. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian.